Hello YouTube, Sidekick here. Today we're going to do something a little bit different. Um, for a while now I've been thinking about a little bit of project that I wanted to do in Microsoft Flight Simulator. Let me explain what it's about. Uh, it's been said that when the Microsoft Flight Simulator 2020 first released to beta testers, the developers kind of wondered where people would want to go. And since they had the whole world to experience, where in that world would the players choose to fly? Well, almost universally, players choose one place. And I'm sure you know what it is, too, if, you're, if you've flown. Players choose to go home. And that's what I did, and I'm sure it's probably what you did. But um, home can actually mean a lot of things. Uh, obviously, the very first thing that I did was go and find my house. But I also realized that Microsoft Flight Simulator was giving me a chance to experience my home in a wider sense. Because, you see, I live in Canada. And in case you're not aware, Canada's a pretty big place. I have actually lived or visited an awful lot of this very large and very diverse country. But Microsoft Flight Simulator gives me the chance to both visit familiar places and to discover parts of Canada I've never seen before. So I decided that what I really would like to do is to fly across the whole country, virtually, from coast to coast, and maybe even to coast, we'll see. Uh, I want to take a virtual trip across Canada, and I'd like you to come along. Um, so let's get the party started, and then I'll, I'll tell you a little bit more about how things are going to work once we're actually underway. Um, to start with, we're here in St. John's International Airport in St. John's, Newfoundland and Labrador. Which, you know, seems like a pretty uncontroversial place to start the journey. Today's flight is not going to be very long. We're just going to take off from the St. John's Airport. We're going to fly out and take a look at St. John's and its famous harbor. And then we're going to take a quick trip out to Cape Spear, which is the most easterly point in Canada. So we'll start from the east. And then we're going to fly up and around the northern end of the Avalon Peninsula and back down the other side. And by, maybe by that time it'll be time for a spot of breakfast. So we're going to drop into Conception Bay South. Now, we'll be able to do that because today, and for the rest of this trip, we're going to be flying in our trusty Grumman Goose, which is a seaplane. Now, the Grumman Goose is a high-wing, twin-engine seaplane that was designed and built in the late 1930s. It was actually commissioned by a businessman living in Long Island who wanted an easy way to get into New York City because, you see, in those days, there actually weren't a lot of airfields. So seaplanes were very popular because they could land wherever there was a stretch of water that was long enough. And that's actually kind of why I chose the Goose for this uh, mission. Um, there's still an awful lot of this country that is not served by airports. There is, however, an awful lot of this country that is served by lakes, rivers, or some other form of waterway. So picking a seaplane seemed like the way to go to make sure we can access as much of the country as possible. It also seemed like a good choice to keep the legs of the journey short. So yeah, I don't really want these video logs to be much more than 30 minutes long, and I don't want to fast forward through too much of the flying just to get to the next airport. So flying the goose means we'll have lots of choices. If we decide it's just time to drop down, take a break, sit on the wing, or maybe do some fishing. Now. As I said, Canada is a very big place, over 5,000 kilometers from St. John's to Victoria. And all of the graphics in Microsoft Flight Simulator are pretty impressive. I doubt they're interesting enough to make you want to tune in to watching me fly each and every one of those kilometers. So, these videos are not really going to be about flying. I hope that they're actually going to be a bit more about the places we fly to and over. I want to make these a kind of a travel log. Uh, with hopefully some interesting facts and stories to accompany the virtual scenery along the way. Um, I hope that in doing the research uh, for these videos, I'm going to learn a little bit more about my country, frankly. And I hope that by coming along for the ride that you will too. And now the first thing I should say is that if you're Canadian, you think that where you live should be on my route. As you have some great stories to tell about that place, then please leave me a comment or come to the Discord server and let me know. For, that, for now, though, um, let's get started talking about St. John's. As I said, we're here on the ground at St. John's International Airport uh, on what passes in Newfoundland for a fine summer morning, uh, I just slightly. Uh, but the truth is that the length of the summer season in Newfoundland and Labrador is a bit of a source of humor for locals and for those who choose to visit it. Uh, there are famous pictures of Queen Elizabeth II visiting St. John's amidst flurries of snow. It was July. I'm not kidding. 
Uh, St. John's also holds the title as both the foggiest and the windiest city in Canada. Uh, but as you can see here today, it's a pretty fine day, although we have some scudding low clouds to deal with. Okay, so we have gotten ourselves all the way out to the runway here, and uh, we're just getting going to get ourselves lined up to take off. Everything seems uh, pretty much warmed up and checked out. So I think we are just about ready to get started on uh, our Cross Canada Tour. Our Canada Goose Cross Canada Tour. Alright folks, the Goose is truly loose. Let's see if we can get it straight off the runway. All right, we're up and going. All right, so we're up and away. Time to get the uh, landing gear cranked up. In the Goose, it was actually a hand crank that you can see down there to the right. Let's go take a look at St. John's. So, beyond complaining about the weather, uh, what are uh, some quick facts about St. John's? Uh, well, it is the capital of the province of Newfoundland and Labrador, and yes, that's two places, uh, but it's one province. Remember that. Uh, St. John's has a population of around 200,000. Uh, it's the easternmost city in Canada and in North America, and, and actually it's 500 kilometers closer to London, England than it is to Edmonton, Alberta. It's the second largest city in Atlantic Canada, the 20th largest city in Canada. It has a long and storied history. Of course, most of what we know comes from a post-Columbian European sources, but those sources do start pretty early. Um, its remarkable harbor, which we're just coming up here on the left, was first remarked upon by John Cabot in 1494. He sailed into the harbor on the feast day of St. John the Baptist, which is how St. John's got its the English name. Uh, although the area was visited by fishermen from several European nations, including Spain and Portugal, as well as England, Throughout the 1500s, they were really only to set up um, seasonal fishing camps. In fact, until 1630, permanent settlements were expressly forbidden, so the town of St. John's was actually not established until sometime in the middle of the 17th century. St. John's was famously the site of Guglielmo Marconi's western terminal when he successfully sent the first transatlantic wireless message from Cornwall. And St. John's also figures prominently in aviation history, having been the departure point for the very first transatlantic flight by John Alcock and Arthur Brown in 1919 in their Vickers Vimy. So we've just passed around St. John's Harbor, which is really uh, its centerpiece and the thing that attracted uh, settlers here in the first place, because it really is a very uh, world-class harbor. We're heading out a little bit to the east here to Cape Spear. Now, Cape Spear is the easternmost point in Canada at a longitude of 52 degrees and 37 minutes west, if you are keeping track. Uh, Cape Spear is a national historic site. It actually features the restoration of the original lighthouse that was built in 1836 and which was actually the home of only one family of lighthouse keepers from the Cantwells for more than 150 years. So Cape Spear is the little... Uh, point of land that is extending out there just passing under the, uh, the cockpit strut there. Cape Spear is available as a free scenery download if you go to a site like uh, flightsim.to and I have actually downloaded that so we get a slightly more high fidelity version of the area and as we fly over here you'll definitely be able to see uh, both the the 1830 lighthouse and then there's also a modern lighthouse which is uh, the slightly taller thinner one there it was built in 1955. I think you can also see two uh, two gun emplacements there. Uh, Cape Spear was actually the site of a coastal defense battery in the Second World War with a couple of 10 inch guns that the uh, Americans lend leased to the British. Uh, don't forget of course, that Newfoundland was not a province of Canada during the Second World War. It was still a British colony at the time. So, I guess since we're kind of at the eastern tip of the country, we can say that our official Canada Goose cross-country flight simulator V-log experience 
starts here. Let's just get another good look at Cape Spear before we move on. Alright, well let's start the tour by heading back over to St. John's and, and let's talk uh, a little bit about wireless communication. That seems like an appropriate thing to do when you're uh, making a YouTube video in the 21st century. Now, telegraphy had existed, uh, existed since about the, the mid-19th century, 1840 or so, but it had always required wires. Um, now, uh, those cables had actually been laid all the way under the Atlantic Ocean by about 1860. Uh, but it was still, um, you know, a lot of infrastructure that was needed to carry signals. So uh, Marconi came up with a system that he believed would work to actually send signals over a distance, and he tried it over fairly short distances. But he wanted to test it over transatlantic distances, and that's the test that he did in 1901, and it ended here on Signal Hill, which, as you can see, just down there to the left. Um, this ushered in, literally, the era of wireless telecommunications, which um, lands us where we are today. All right, well, we've had a look at St. John's from both sides now. Um, and so now we're going to head uh, north uh, along the part of the Avalon Peninsula that terminates in Cape St. Francis. And I guess it also gives us, uh, me an opportunity to talk about, you know, what one of, one of the biggest issues I'm going to have in trying to put together this series, I can already tell. And that is, I'm um, trying to decide exactly where to go. Like, um, for instance, let's, let's just take a quick look at a map of Newfoundland here. Um, you know, you can see that even the island itself is way too large for us to do, to see very much of it. So we're actually going to restrict ourselves to a part of the, the island of Newfoundland that's known as the Avalon Peninsula, which is here. And in point of fact, we aren't even going to be able to see all of that. Now, the Avalon Peninsula is the part of Newfoundland that sticks out into the Grand Banks, which are the prime fishing grounds that were discovered in the uh, 1500s. It actually, about half the population of Newfoundland lives on the Avalon Peninsula. The peninsula itself is kind of divided up by four bays. There's Conception Bay, and Trinity Bay on the north, and St. Mary's Bay and Placentia Bay on the south. And there are fishing villages all along uh, both sides of all four bays. And so over the course of our trip, we'll try and get to see at least a little uh, of those four bays. I'm not sure we'll get to St. Mary's Bay, but I think we'll see at least part of all of the others. Now, Cape St. Francis is the northeast headland uh, up here, and that's where we're headed right now. Now, Cape St. Francis has a bit of a reputation as being an area of foul weather, even by Newfoundland standards. I guess it's kind of living up to that a little bit today. Uh, but notwithstanding, actually, the low cloud, I think it actually kind of contributes to the atmosphere. Flying up here on the far east coast of Newfoundland, so maybe we'll just enjoy the view for a little while. Microsoft Flight Simulator finishes populating those cliffs down there. They're actually quite interesting. Well, it certainly gives you an idea of what uh, the coast would be like in foggy weather, doesn't it? So as we come to sort of a break in the cliffs here, this is the town of Tor Bay, which is about halfway up the peninsula, and it looks like we're coming out of the, the cloud bank there, get a little bit of better look across the peninsula and up to Cape Francis in the town of Torbay. Now, as I was saying, Cape St. Francis did have a reputation for particularly foul weather. In fact, the weather was so foul uh, that in the mid-19th century, uh, the communities up and down Conception Bay, which is uh, the bay that's on the other side of this peninsula, actually petitioned to have a lighthouse built at Cape St. Francis because, of course, uh, Cape St. Francis was the point uh, on the peninsula that they had to pass when they came back from the uh, fishing grounds that were on this side of Newfoundland, on the Grand Banks, on the Atlantic side. 
So in the mid-1870s, they asked that there be a lighthouse built at the tip of the peninsula to protect them when they were coming home. Um, and that uh, that petition was eventually granted. Although in truth, um, although it did, the lighthouse did have a light, it was really the most important part of the installation uh, was its powerful phonic signal, which is a direct quote. So basically it was a big foghorn. Uh, and actually that foghorn was driven uh, by steam. It was a steam siren trumpet and it was installed in 1877. And the closest community to the Cape St. Francis Lighthouse, which still stands and which you can go visit today, is Pouch Cove, which we are just now passing there on the left-hand side. And one interesting thing about the lighthouse, apparently, uh, is that one of the big issues with it was that the foghorn relied on fresh water to supply the boilers uh, for the steam engine. Uh, and the brook that supplied the fresh water actually froze in the middle of the winter, causing recourse to horse-drawn wagons to actually supply the boilers, which seems a little funny, uh, since we end up with a lighthouse that's out on a promontory, surrounded by water, that has to have water trucked in. Now we're coming up on Cape St. Francis here again on the left-hand side. Uh, unfortunately, in Microsoft Flight Simulator, there is no specific point of interest modeling the Cape St. Francis lighthouse, so we'll kind of just have to imagine it. Although, uh, you know, taking a look, it isn't hard to imagine why people would want a lighthouse. Down here. Well, having made the turn around Cape St. Francis, we're now crossing over from the Atlantic side into the Conception Bay side of Newfoundland. And we can continue to enjoy the view. Maybe we'll just uh, speed up the flight a little bit here and enjoy a musical interlude as we work our way down to the point uh, where we're going to see if we can uh, land and maybe find ourselves some breakfast. So we've flown around Cape St. Francis and down the, uh, we are on the east side of Conception Bay and coming down near the base of Conception Bay. Now, uh, originally, you know, particularly the 19th and early 20th century, uh, these would have been a series of outports, uh, mainly fishing villages. But um, this part of Conception Bay, um, the shore of Conception Bay, was pretty popular because it was actually quite a bit more sheltered than the Atlantic coast just on the other side. Um, and there was reasonably easy access to the Atlantic Coast fishery by going uh, essentially north to Cape St. Francis and then, and then around and out into the Grand Banks. 
Um, but you were able to live in the communities down here, which were, frankly, a little bit more sheltered, a little bit better agricultural land, uh, some fairly ample timber. And St. John's was really just um, a short uh, drive uh, over land. So um, this was a reasonably heavily populated part uh, of Newfoundland. Now, of course, today, um, this part of Conception Bay has actually basically been amalgamated into the greater uh, metropolitan area of St. John. It's known as Conception Bay South, and it's actually an amalgamation of nine communities uh, that used to be separate. But as you can see, it's, uh, it's pretty well populated. Now, this little marina that's coming up here on the left is of interest to us because that's, uh, that's our destination. Uh, we're going to go down there and pull into the marina and see if we can find a place to get us some breakfast and maybe hope for the weather to get a little better before we continue our uh, Cross Canada uh, video log here. So we're just uh, turning across the, the marina here. We're going to do a short downwind leg and then we're going to come around and land this goose on the water a good picture of Conception Bay south here. If you look up there, you can actually see St. John's. We're really only about 20 kilometers away. Uh, we've flown a ways today, but we've really just gone around almost in uh, two sides of a big, three sides of a big, uh, well, two sides of a big triangle, I guess you could say. So we're getting ready to settle down here, pulled back the power, uh, letting the speed bleed off, and we're going to drop the flaps here in a minute. Here we get the flaps down, they'll come down on their own once we slow down, that's how it works in the goose. And we'll basically start our base turn here and start picking up a landing point. Around the corner we go, dropping down as we go. So today the winds are reasonably calm, so we don't need to uh, take them into account as we line up on f on uh, coming from our base onto final here. Uh, more to the point, though, it means that the waves are, are going to be reasonably, the water's reasonably calm, uh, so we won't have to worry about that uh, when landing, because of course this is, a, this is an open water landing, it's not a lake or river, this is actually uh, the Atlantic Ocean, albeit uh, uh, a reasonably protected part of it. Okay. There is our marina up ahead there. We look like we're on a good final here. We're just letting, uh, keeping the speed constant, letting the altitude drop. And once we get close enough, we'll just pull back and start bleeding off that speed. Come around here, start pulling it up, and just hold it off as long as we can. Well, almost there. Keep holding it off. Bounce. Not too bad, but we're down. Now, in the goose, we want to keep our speed up a little bit once we're on the water, because we want to stay up on the plane. Uh, that is up on the planing surface of the hull. And that gives us a lot more uh, control over uh, direction. So we're going to stay up, uh, keep our speed up a little bit here as we come up towards uh, the marina and once we get closer we'll slow down and we'll pull our way in. Now the great thing about the goose is that it's not just a seaplane, it's actually an amphibian which means that once we get closer to the shore we'll actually be able to put the landing gear down and kind of wade our way out of the water and onto the ground. Right here we are approaching what probably in real life is breakwater. Uh, in, in Microsoft Flight Simulator this turns out to be a fairly flat strip of land. I doubt we could really do this in real life, but hey, what the heck, we just put the landing gear down and we're pulling ourselves up out of the water and we'll just turn ourselves down along the breakwater here and then uh, we'll go see if we can find some place that'll give us some breakfast. So hope you enjoyed this first installment of the Canada Goose cross-country video travel log. I uh, hope to have some other installments for you uh, soon. 
uh, please uh, let me know in the comments uh, if you enjoyed the video and again let me know other places you think I should see or come by the discord channel and have a discussion but that's gonna wrap it up for uh, this installment the very first installment hope you enjoyed uh, watching it as much as I enjoyed flying it and for now this is gonna be sidekick signing off